In a prior video, we discussed investor Patrick and some of the challenges he could face at building a stock portfolio himself. In this mini lesson, we'll discuss how a managed product, such as a mutual fund, could address these challenges. Mutual funds can be summarized by the following five points. Number one, a mutual fund can be thought of as a big pot of money to which many investors contribute. Number two, investors obtain units in the fund according to how much they invested and the net asset value per unit at the time the order is processed. Net asset value per unit is just a fancy term for the value of each unit. For example, if an individual invested $1,000 and at a time the order was processed, the net asset value per unit was $10, she would receive 100 units. Number three, the fund manager invests the fund's assets according to a certain mandate which is disclosed in the various legal documents. For example, if it is a bond fund, the manager will obviously invest in bonds. If it's an equity fund, in equities. The fund mandate can be quite broad, such as a large cap global equity fund, or quite specific, such as a small cap Canadian equity fund or precious metals fund. Number four, once the investor has selected a fund or group of funds, they can sit back and let the fund manager do his or her job. And number five, investors will then profit or lose based upon how many units they own and how the fund performs. In other words, if a fund earns investment income and pays it out to unit holders, it would do so on a per unit basis. One of the best ways to understand a product, such as a mutual fund, is to understand the advantages it provides. These include, number one, relatively low cost professional management in comparison to building your own individualized portfolio. Recall that all funds have a qualified portfolio manager to manage the fund's assets. The fund manager is paid out of the fund's assets, which means all unit holders are essentially sharing in the cost. Number two, Flexible purchase options. You can invest a large lump sum or as little as $25 or $50 per month under a pre-authorized contribution plan. Number three, a variety of funds. Some of the fund categories include money market funds, fixed income funds, equity funds, balance funds, specialty funds, etc. And number four, even if an investor selects only one fund, there will be some degree of diversification given the fund itself is diversified. It's important to note that the management expense ratio of a fund, which includes the management fee, reduces the investor's return. For example, if the fund had an 8% gross return before fees, but has a 2% MER, the unit holder's net return would only be 6%. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that lower management fees are always best. The management fee that funds charge will vary based upon how much work is involved for the manager, the types of investments, the strategies used, require expertise, etc. For example, if an equities fund mandate is simply to mimic the return of the overall stock market, which is referred to as passive investing, it would charge a lower management fee as compared to a fund where the manager is being asked to outperform the market, in other words, active management. An example of passive investing would be investing in an exchange traded fund or ETF for short that can be indexed to a particular stock market index like the New York Stock Exchange. Segregated funds are a type of managed product that are offered by insurance companies. The name refers to the fact that the fund's assets are kept separate or segregated from the insurer's own assets. Seg funds are often discussed alongside mutual funds when speaking to clients Assuming, of course, the advisor is licensed to sell both mutual funds and insurance products. I often refer to segregated funds as fancy versions of mutual funds because they have a lot of similarities. Much like mutual funds, a segregated fund is made up of a basket of securities that is professionally managed. However, segregated funds also offer three key features that mutual funds do not. Number one, they offer a guarantee upon the death of the annuitant or upon the contract's expiry date, which is usually 10 years. A fund can guarantee as little as the legal minimum of 75% of the initial amount invested, or in some cases as high as 100%. Now you may be thinking, well big deal, they're only guaranteeing what I put in. But it's better than losing principal, so in some scenarios it can be meaningful to a particular client. 
Number two, since segregated funds are an insurance product, they offer the possibility of creditor protection. Under certain circumstances, your creditors may have no claim on your segregated fund investments, even if you're filing for bankruptcy. And number three, they provide the ability to avoid probate fees, which is a fee that generally applies to assets transferred via one's last will and testament. Since a segregated fund allows the naming of a beneficiary, the funds go directly to the beneficiary upon the annuitant's death, thereby avoiding probate fees. With all this in mind, why would anyone select a mutual fund when segregated funds exist? They sound so much better. Well, it depends on the investor, and there is a catch. For example, the guarantees do come at a cost. All else being equal, a segregated fund would carry a higher management expense ratio. For example, if the MER on a mutual fund is 2.5%, the MER on an otherwise similar segregated fund may be 3%. Investors need to weigh up the advantages that segregated funds provide against the higher MERs and determine if their personal situation warrants the additional cost.